Hello everyone, my name is Jeffrey Pereira and today I'm here at UCSF's Mission Bay campus with Dr. Charles Craig. He earned a PhD in chemistry from Columbia University and then moved down to the Bay Area to do his postdoc in biochemistry and biophysics. Dr. Craig is a pro professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry here at UCSF and is also the founder and former director of the Chemistry and Chemical Biology graduate program and the co-director of the Molecular Oncology program. On top of all this, he leads a state-of-the-art lab that focuses on defining the roles and the mechanisms of enzymes and other challenging proteins in complex biological processes. Dr. Craig, it is a pleasure for me to be speaking with you today and to be given the opportunity to hear your story firsthand. <laughs> Great. Very nice to meet you, Jeffrey. Uh, what would you like to hear? So, let's start by, I don't know, I've introduced you a little bit, but I'd like to hear from you. Who are you? And what do you do? First and foremost, I'm a scientist. Uh, I'm asked that question sometimes when I get on a plane, uh, flying internationally, what is your profession? And I put in bold letters, I believe I'm a scientist. Uh, I'm curious at heart. I love trying to figure out how things work. That took me to a chemistry background. And then as I evolved and found that I could do chemistry, I really wanted to work at that interface between chemistry and medicine and pharmacy. And that involves developing drugs, that involves validating therapeutic targets, and trying to make the world better than it was when I came into it, potentially with therapeutics and diagnostics and uh, facilitating better human health. So take me back to your earlier years, from your childhood to studying chemistry as an undergrad at Columbia. What was your upbringing like? Well, first of all, let's back up a little bit. So I did my graduate work at Columbia. My undergraduate was at a college known as Allegheny College. I'm originally from Western Pennsylvania, a small town outside of Pittsburgh, Midland, Pennsylvania. Um, Pretty small town, and to get into a good school like Allegheny, fortunately I was able to get in there somewhat on a basketball scholarship. They don't really give basketball scholarships, but um, they helped me out. And uh, But my basketball uh, um, training uh, overlapped with my chemistry classes. And I had to make a choice pretty early on as to whether I was going to go basketball or I was going to go chemistry and I realized I wasn't going to make a living playing basketball and I might have a chance if I could get better at, at, uh, at my chemistry. So I focused on chemistry and I turned, turned out I really liked it. I was good at it. Other people didn't seem to like it and I just loved it. So it helped me differentiate. Then I got into Columbia. Uh, that was a big step uh, for me and I uh, was surrounded by a lot of people from pretty big name schools, but it turns out my training was extremely strong and uh, I was able to excel there. And I moved into the area of physical chemistry. I liked synthetic chemistry, but I found that physical chemistry was something I just loved the structure function aspect, how things work, and uh, that got me really excited. And that eventually, in a chemistry department, working on enzymes, trying to understand the chemistry of how enzymes work just fascinated me and I just got hooked and I, I knew what I wanted to work on. I wanted to understand how enzymes can do their catalytic transformations that a synthetic chemist could, it's very hard to ever do what nature's able to do and I'm still fascinated by that and have evolved into other aspects but it all gets back to physical chemistry, how proteins and enzymes work. When you think back, what is your earliest memory of falling in love with these sciences? Ooh, uh, okay, um, so back to where I started, um, Midland, Pennsylvania. It's a steel mill town, and the chemistry that goes on in terms of making steel is kind of fascinating when it's going on around you. Fortunately, my father was someone who didn't work in the steel mill. He actually worked uh, in the water purification plant. He was the director of the, um, of the water and sewage plant. So I would go with him on weekends to learn how to 
filter the water and see if there were coliform bacteria in there and determine the pH of the water and uh, was there CO2 in it because it was on the Ohio River and this was back in the days when the Ohio River caught fire. It was that polluted. So he was always dealing with that sort of stuff. And, and that was more analysis. It wasn't so much discovery, but it was the idea of chemistry. Chemistry was there. You had to understand chemistry. And the more you knew about chemistry, the more you could determine whether the water that was coming out of the, the tap was clean and pure and wasn't going to make you sick. And that was fascinating, but it wasn't enough for me. It was learning who figured out how to do those experiments to determine the pH and how much chlorine was in there and whether bacteria. That's what really got me. And I wanted to learn how to do that. <laughs> Could you have seen yourself doing anything outside of a career in science? <laughs> yes. Well, I wanted a job. So coming from an area like that, and I worked in the steel mill for two summers, and that's heavy lifting. <laughs> Especially when you're working the night shift, because when you're just coming in, you have to take whatever job you can get. And so I worked in the, um, electric furnaces where they bring 10,000 volt electrodes down into a big chamber and literally electrocute all the chemicals that are in there to make stainless steel. So <laughs> I was working in that and um, it, I love the chemistry of it, but this was extremely hard work. Uh, folks that work in there, uh, God love them. I mean, it's, it's just tough. Uncles, uh, cousins, uh, people that I went to high school with, they work there and I, and I, I really believe in them, but I didn't want to do that. <laughs> and I knew that was waiting for me if I, when I gave up my basketball scholarship and was going to start learning to do something, I wanted to use chemistry to differentiate myself and then get a job. <laughs> and during graduate school, I had my first job offer and I almost took it. And then I realized as I was talking to the person in front of me, I really wanted their job. <laughs> I didn't want to work for them. I wanted to be in their position. And so I thought, let me go back and let me get my PhD and then I'll get a better job. And then I got a call from uh, someone. I was able to publish a paper in a high profile journal. It was, it was Nature. And it was a discovery. It was kind of exciting what we, what we learned. And I got a call from someone out here who was starting a biotech company. And he had been able to make, uh, their company was able to make a small peptide in bacteria. This was the beginning of recombinant DNA. And the person was Carrie Mullis on the other end of the phone. And Carrie Mullis eventually got the Nobel Prize for the polymerase chain reaction. We didn't know that back then, but he was saying, hey, I saw your paper. Can you come out and help us purify this protein, that w which turned out to be gamma interferon, that was made in bacteria? And I said, uh, sure, I'll come out. And I flew out and I met him. And once again, it happened. He said, come work with us. You do this. Um, and it was a job. And I realized, no, I wanted to be in his position. <laughs> So then I came over here and met a guy by the name of William Rudder and got a chance to be a postdoc in his lab and to learn how to do all that kind of biotech stuff, molecular biology, recombinant DNA. Um, and I was a, there I used my synthetic chemistry skills to stitch together DNA so you could do site-directed mutagenesis. I was one of the early people to do that. And so long answer to your question, but I wanted to get a job, but I kept wanting to not just necessarily work for someone else and do what they want to do. I wanted to discover my own things, and that's how I ended up here. If you could name a few, which individuals have had the most valuable impact on the trajectory of your life, and how? Okay, uh, there's a couple, and uh, first one was a guy by the name of Milan Kasanovich. He was the chemistry professor in high school. Now our high school is a good high school, but it's a very small high school and most people went to high school to go work in the steel mill. And it turns out the chemistry professor had retired. And Milan Kasanovich, um, sorry. 
um, Milan Kasanovich was the um, metallurgist in the steel mill and he had learned that there was no chemistry professor in high school so he took the 11 to 7 shift in the steel mill so he could come over in the morning and teach us how uh, the basics of chemistry and he was also someone he had gone to Penn State and he took three of us at the end of the class and I remember them the other two very well and he said I don't know what you're planning on doing but you have some abilities that some of the other students don't and I encourage you to do something with it and that was something that gave me confidence that maybe I could go and not just go work in the steel mill and do something else. And there's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with working in the steel mill. It just wasn't, look at me, it wasn't for me. I'm pretty, you know, I, I can hold my own, but I, that, that's pretty heavy lifting and I wanted to try to use my head. So that, Milan was very, very important. Then Ed Walsh at Allegheny College, he was an organic chemistry professor. He spotted me, we became very close friends. Um, he died a few years ago and I was able to set up um, a memorial lecture in his name back at Allegheny and, and uh, I know his wife and I know the, uh, some of his family. He was essential for keeping me from becoming a delinquent <laughs> and staying focused and doing what I wanted to do, what I loved doing and uh, making a difference. And uh, it, that, was, that was extremely important. And then uh, in graduate school, I also had uh, two great mentors. One, Sherman Bachok, um, he was a physical chemist, and the other, Charles Cantor, and he's still a great physical chemist. Both of them, critical times, caught me to encourage me to do something special with what skills I had. Um, they were extremely important to, to give me some confidence to go become a scientist and discover something important. As teenagers, we're often told to quote, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. What were your friends growing up like? And to what extent do you agree with this statement? It's a cool statement. <laughs> I hadn't heard it before. Um, well, I came from a very close knit family. Um, so the people that I grew up with were pretty much my family. Uh, my mother was from a family of um, nine other siblings and everyone lived within a five mile radius and so Sundays were cousins and uncles and aunts and everybody knew one another and that was very very special. It was also very very hard to leave but that gave me real um, grounding in how important people are to me and they covered for me, they watched my backs, uh, I watched their backs, but that was essential. Um, so family was very important, but it can go so far because I eventually had to leave. Second thing, I would agree with that, um, I got into basketball early on. So I was very fortunate. Um, Midland is uh, um, very diverse, so I was one of the few uh, white guys to play on a basketball team that won the state championship. And uh, the better players were guys that were not white and they embraced me and they treated me as an equal. Not initially, because I wasn't very good, <laughs> but I kept working and they all said that I might not be the best person on the team, but I was absolutely the hardest working. So I was the James Brown of, of the basketball team. Um, they were essential. And Ed Okowski, who was the coach, um, was essential. So I'd, I'd agree with that part of it because they helped, once again, build that confidence in me. And I've stayed in touch with them for a long time. And then, you know, I was kind of a loner. So that's where I don't completely agree with it because I... I had that really strong foundation in the beginning, so I didn't need that many other people after that because I could always go back to my core. Um, but over the years, I've, I've, uh, I've met some really special people 
and I'd rather have one or two friends that I have for my life than many. And uh, those few friends are really precious to me. What are KRAS targeted treatments and how did you approach turning a cancer gene into an eat me flag for the immune system? Wow, you're on the ball. Um, great, that's a, that's a great uh, result we're very excited about. So what you're referring to is a paper we just it was just published September 10th in Cancer Cell. And it's a collaboration with a close colleague of mine, uh, Kayvon Shokat. And he had developed a treatment for oncogenes that are associated with a number of cancers, in particular lung cancers, colon cancers, and pancreatic cancers. And in particular, it's an irreversible drug. It's a chemical compound that irreversibly binds to that oncogene. And that oncogene is known as KRAS. And there's a specific mutation in it, a <clears throat> glycine to a cysteine. And when that occurs, that cell will become uh, oncogenic. It will become a tumor. Now he made a molecule that traps that enzyme in an inactive state. And that was a great discovery eight or nine years ago. And I remember when that happened and we started talking, well, you know, resistance will eventually come up. What could we do with that if resistance did came up, come up? And we had the idea, well, if it's irreversibly bound to the enzyme inside, that chemical compound can't come off. So it's stuck to it. So Peter Rowader, a graduate student in the lab, studied for over three years figuring out how it can make its way to the surface of the cell and it still has that chemical compound on it. So that's the eat me signal. It says, I've been tagged. And so we then generated an antibody that can recognize that chemical, that eat me signal on the surface of the cell and then bring immunotherapy to it. And we tied up with a postdoc in Kayvon's lab, Ziyang Zhang, and uh, we're able to show something that people had never shown before. And it has the potential of restoring the activity of these treatments that work, but then resistance comes up. So we're working with folks, clinicians across the street, Pamela Munster, to show that this could actually work. We are, I am so excited about that. Thank you for asking that question. I, I love that paper. In the context of enzymes, what is macromolecular recognition? Okay. The way that an enzyme can recognize the thing that it's going to bind to to carry out the chemical transformation, that is molecular recognition. How does an enzyme find the thing that it has to do its reaction on from all the other things that are out there? I can recognize you now that I met you if you're in a group of a thousand people. How can an enzyme recognize one chemical versus the billions of other chemicals that are out there? It's a really fascinating question and it's the basis of how enzymes recognize one another. It's the basis of how that antibody that we design that can recognize that eat me signal how do you get that to be specific? And if you can get it to be specific, then it will be less toxic because if it binds to something else, that can lead to toxicity. If it binds to this, it can cure that cancer, potentially. So it's really fundamental. So even though we have this very applied aspect for a treatment, there's a lot of academic questions to, to answer. And, and that's what, kind of keeps me getting up in the morning and coming in on weekends. How can proteins and antibodies be engineered to tackle diseases like cancer? And how do your approaches differ from other protein engineering labs around the world? Well, we are constantly trying to figure out how to do something better than the way other people have done it. So one of the best examples is that, that one we just talked about 
getting an antibody to recognize something that people didn't realize would be out there before. Other people can make those antibodies as well, but we just showed this is one way to do it. But there's a, there's a postdoc in the lab now, uh, Dong Hee Chung, who has this really cool technology for finding the really rare antibodies out of a library of 10 to the 10th. So 10 billion antibodies, all displayed on phage, so that there's in one test tube, there's 10 billion antibodies in there. How do you find the one that's the really special one that is unique? And he's developed this really cool technology to be able to sort through all of those and find the good ones. That's one way we try to distinguish ourselves. Other people can do those kinds of things as well, but what works here, it goes back to one of those ideas I mentioned before that about me. I like to work on teams. I maybe was not the best basketball player on the team, but I was the hardest working one. So when everyone else was tired, I came in as the sixth man sometime. I work with teams and I do what I do well, and I can make antibodies or I can understand how enzymes work or I can do structure function, but then I pair up with someone like Kayvon who's really good at making these very special inhibitors. And I work with Pamela Munster over there who's telling me, here's the unmet need. Don't just do that as a, as a card trick, as something that's cool. Do it because it's an unmet need and it can help me do something with this patient that I couldn't do before. So you see, we've made a team now and I'm, I'm a key person of that team, but that's how the antibodies I make might be a little bit more useful because I'm, I'm benefiting from my teammates. So you mentioned applying your research efforts to patients. My question is, what do you do to maximize the in-clinic translatability of your work? Oh, <laughs> I listen to other people, all right? So I decided early on that I wanted to become a scientist. I remember thinking about going to medical school, um, actually got into it and then realized, oh, this isn't really what I want to do. I want to do discovery. Other people might be able to go to medical school and do that. For me, I needed to get really good grounding in chemistry. And so I figured that's what I was going to be an expert in. And then doing chemistry at the chemistry biology interface, chemistry medicine interface, listening to what other people can do on the clinical side, that's one of my big uh, goals in the future. How do we take the work that we do here, which is very fundamental, very discovery based, and help translate it across the street into the clinic over there? And even though it's only a few hundred yards, that is the valley of death <laughs> to get across, right? It's the gap that you can crash and burn really quick if, you, if you're too naive and you think, oh, I'm gonna go in now and I'm gonna cure cancer. I'm gonna cure all infectious disease. Dial it down, carve out a piece, understand it really well, work with people that are experts in what they can do, and they can maybe help guide me on that path. But I'm not saying that we should just be doing science for that application, you want to do curiosity driven science to discover something because sometimes you don't know how to get across the street. You got to go up here and then go over there. And so it's being as broad minded as possible with the eventual goal. I want to impact human health in a positive way if I'm able. And I'd like to learn some things along the way too. But I'd love it if I can impact it and make it better for, for someone else who's, who's suffering. What is your hot take? What is my hot take? You gotta say that in a different way. I think I'm from a different generation. Hot take meaning an opinion that you feel strongly about that may or may not be controversial. <laughs> A hot take. Oh, now I get it. Oh, all right. Um, my hot take is that scientists do not have to be nerds. Scientists are really cool people. And 
we have feelings and we have uh, egos and we have families sometimes and uh, loves and hates, but we're just people. There's nothing that special about us. It's just we like solving problems and we're except for in movies and the crazy scientist that's trying to destroy the world that's a movie yeah yes there might be some people like that but the majority of us are really trying to make the place better than it was when we came if we could just understand it a little bit, bit more now if that's a hot take I think right now there's a lot of controversy about whether science is good or bad. Science is absolutely good. It's what's going to keep us here. And I think that's important in understanding the people that do that. We're actually a good group of people. <laughs> if you could think back, when was the time you failed miserably, but it was only through this failure that you achieved something so great? Okay, let's go back to Allegheny College. I'm a freshman in, yes, I'm a rising sophomore. And we had an outside speaker, and his name was Stan Lee. So this is Stan Lee of Marvel Comics. And he gave, I remember it was a spectacular talk about how he would come up with ideas like the Fantastic Four or Spider-Man. And I always thought I could be a Spider-Man, right? And uh, he gave his talk and the auditorium was filled and then everybody left and I stayed because I wanted to maybe introduce myself. And pretty soon I find myself, I'm the only one and it's Stan, everyone else was gone. And so I started talking to him and we're talking and he's answering my questions. And I said, Stan, um, can we keep talking? He said, well, I'm in Meadville, Pennsylvania. I'm not sure I have anything else to do until my plane goes. Sure, why don't we talk? I said, I want to be a comic book artist like you. He said, well, let me see your drawings. He said, okay, great. So I run over to my, to Baldwin Hall. I come back with my, my sketch pads and I show him what I'm doing. And he looks at it and he says, Charles, you have some skills, but I think you might want to have a different goal in life. <laughs> and I remember how shattered I was. We continued to talk, but in a lot of ways, I thought my heart had been ripped out, but it was the best thing he could have told me to do because he said, go do something else that you're really good at. You might want to do this, but you're not very good. <laughs> I can laugh at it now, but I cried that night and I I had to change my goals. I thought I wanted to be doing something, writing uh, children's books and illustrating them. That was my initial goal and I loved literature and I loved English. I said, I better do something else. Maybe chemistry, that stuff that I was doing might help me. What's your guilty pleasure? <laughs> you ask great questions. Um, Guilty pleasure. Ah, I really do enjoy um, something like biking to work, all right? And I haven't driven to work for years. And there's a bike outside and I live up on one of the tallest hills in the, in the city. But I really like taking my bike pretty much anywhere. And I learned a few years when I really years, years ago when I really started biking that if you're going to bike, you should bike. And that might seem really simple, but it really says a guilty pleasure of mine. Yes, it might be faster to do it this way or to do it, but I got a bike. Why don't I take a bike? Then I don't have to use a car and I don't have to add my carbon footprint. So sometimes I show up in weird places with a bike and a helmet and my pants rolled up and people are looking at me kind of, so I think there's a little bit of guilt in me thinking I'm being a little obnoxious when pushing this a little too far, but I love it because I feel so much better when I get off the bike and I go home and I go to sleep. <laughs> so I'd say maybe that's a guilty pleasure, but. What is one moment when you realize you made the right career choice? Ah, 
Um, remember those enzymes that I got fascinated by in, in, uh, in college and uh, high school? When I learned that enzymes could do what chemists can do so much better <laughs> sometimes. Um, and I wanted to understand them, but I wasn't sure I was going to make a living doing this. And working as a postdoctoral fellow with another important person in my life, William Rudder, uh, he was my postdoc mentor. We were able to change the function of an enzyme. In other words, we, we knew what this enzyme could do, and using the tools back then of site-directed mutagenesis and um, substrate modification, I was able to change the function of that enzyme. And it was ended up in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and got interviewed. And all that was kind of like a little much, but what it did is it made me realize I made the right choice. Even though it didn't necessarily help someone who was sick or any, but it was the first time someone had changed the function of an enzyme in a predictable fashion like that. And that gave me confidence I was on the right track. The next step was learning how to do something that had real, beyond the curiosity based part, but that could then make some, some application that would be a benefit. As a scientist leading such a successful lab, what does it feel like to be on the frontier of advancement? Oh, that's very kind of you to say it. <laughs> that's, um, keep in mind, I'm at a place like UCSF where colleagues of mine are winning Nobel Prizes or winning Lasker Awards or uh, getting in the National Academies. So I, I, there's people way above me. I learned this also in basketball. There's always someone who can uh, jump higher than I can, run faster than I can, um, have abilities that I just don't have. I feel that way at, at UCSF. I leave my ego at the doorstep. I have one, but I leave it at the doorstep. I come in here, I learn as much as I can. I try to contribute. And then when I leave, I pick my ego back up. Um, so it's very kind of you to say that I'm at the frontier. I'm. I'm there learning and watching and uh, trying to do the best I can. It's always exciting for me because every day I come here, I learn something. There's not a day that there, I can say it. I've been here for over 30 years and there's not a single day that I haven't learned something that I didn't know when I came here. And, and that, that's extremely motivating. Can I contribute? That's what I'm always trying to do. A lot of research nowadays is highly competitive, especially when it comes to publishing in high impact journals and even earning research grants. How does this impact the type of research you pursue? Are you always able to fulfill your personal needs through research? Ooh, um, another fortunate aspect of working in a place like UCSF. Um, I can learn from the best. so. I've learned how to write grants and how to make them attractive for funding, but they don't always get funded. No matter how good you are, and no matter what you've done in the past, it's like, well, what have you done for me lately? What's your next new big idea? And sometimes when I submit a grant, it's, it's not good enough to make the cut. So I've learned um, through colleagues uh, here at UCSF that have access to donors that want to make a difference with their wealth, how to get introduced to some of those individuals, and to determine whether some of the things we're doing is something that they feel is of value, and occasionally some of them are willing to provide me some resources. It's not the same as NIH funding, which is maybe five years, the potential for an additional round of, of funding, but when it's 10% of the things that are getting submitted, that get funded, well, you got to have diversification in your portfolio. So I've been fortunate enough to have uh, been introduced to particular donors that are willing to support some of my research. Uh, that helps. I also, chemists, uh, when I came here, once you're a chemist, you're always a chemist. <laughs> it is just the way it is. 
Uh, chemists are very practical in starting companies. And so I have no uh, inhibition of filing a patent for something, uh, trying to start a company, providing jobs for people that have worked in the lab or other people. Sometimes those companies are successful and then I can get additional research funding from them. So that's a third way of diversifying my portfolio. And sometimes we do bake sales. <laughs> so we'll do whatever is necessary to try and get some funding. But the key part of that is that when you do get funding, that you do something with it. You do something meaningful that's going to have an impact. So then you can say to someone who says, well, what have you done before? You say, well, here's this is how much money it took me to get to here. And and if I had this much money, I might be able to get here. Right. So it's it's like a negotiation. It's not saying just give me the money because I'm smart. It's saying I really think I've got a plan how this could change things and we could learn more from it. And sometimes that resonates and sometimes it doesn't. So you can't give up. You just got to keep trying. How have you incorporated other fields into your work and how do you go about identifying potentially fruitful collaborations? Uh, other fields, anything. I'll take anything. All right. So biophysics, biochemistry, um, informatics. We're really excited about the idea of using um, artificial intelligence to develop training sets to make it more predictive. Uh, definitely uh, biology. I had never taken really a biology class before, so I'm surrounded by bi biology. So going to seminars and, and uh, absorbing as much as I can, but finding the right people that can help interpret it for me is the reason I stay at UCSF so much because it's such a community. And I, if, if I want to learn about pancreatic cancer with my colleague Kimberly Kirkwood, who's a gastrointestinal surgeon, she's so patient with me and takes me over to the operating room to allow me to watch what she does. That's an experience that finding those people that are willing to teach me because they think I can help with what I learn with solving the problems that they've come up with. That's what I'm constantly scanning for. And, and there's a wealth of them around here. It's a great place to do that. It's, and this isn't the only place that does that, but this is what's worked for me. And, and anything that, will help me solve a problem, I'm open to it. I want to start my own lab at UCSF, design and initiate a graduate program, and be a professor of pharmaceutical chemistry at UCSF. Describe to me, step by step, and in detail, the steps you have taken to reach the level of success that you have. Um, okay, I'm glad you feel that it's successful. I'm always um, wondering, uh, could we make it better? But my first suggestion is don't do what I did, all right? Do something I didn't do. That's my first suggestion. I came here as a chemist uh, back in 1981, all right? And it's not that there weren't chemists here before, but I didn't feel there were enough of them. There were many, many biologists. So I wanted to see more chemists like myself that cared about using chemistry to answer biological questions. So I wanted to provide an environment for them. And I was just very fortunate that right at that time, there was this real interest in getting more chemists after I became a professor. So 81, I was here trying to make my own discoveries, then got my own laboratory in 1985 and then started doing things and I realized I needed more students that were like-minded. Um, there were great students, I had fantastic students coming, but I wanted more chemistry and other people wanted more chemistry around here. So I worked with people here to build a community that was going to be a good launching pad for the sorts of things that you're seeing being done now. But I had so much help from so many people to help bring the resources. We got a donor to provide some of the initial resources. 
to then put what's called a training grant together to go to the NIH and say, this is a good environment for chemists to learn chemistry and biologists who wanted to come over and do this. And the timing just turned out to be right because try and do a training grant like that without what was happening at the NIH, they would have said, wait a minute, you're a medical school. You can't have a chemistry department there. Chemistry departments are just where all the undergraduates were. And we said, no, the questions are the exciting things here. You want the chemists here, so why can't we build a chemistry department in a medical school, in a pharmacy school? And they got it. And it wasn't just me, it was the whole nation there were people in chemistry departments that realized, let's reach over to the biology departments and make a marriage between them. And so there were resources from the NIH saying, if you do this, we'll provide you some resources to make that happen. So I'd come back to you and say, if you want to do that, find the thing that we're missing right now and come in and make that happen. And it won't be just you, it's going to be you and a team of other people that's going to make it successful. What advice would you give to the younger generation of up-and-coming scientists? <laughs> I've never been good at taking advice and I don't like giving advice because you got to find your own way. you got to find the thing that works with you. And so what I've learned in situations like that is I try to tell stories and I try to give examples of things that I know about. And then if any of that resonates with you, then take that to the bank. But do it because you want to do it. Don't do it because I told you to. <laughs> I, I've made so many mistakes and I've, I wish I would have taken better <laughs> advice, but I had to find my own way by making mistakes, falling down, getting back up and realizing, okay, it was all right to fall, but I, if I keep trying, I'm gonna get something done. So if there's anything that resonates in that, it's that it's hard to do this. If you're going to do research, you have to realize that if it's real research, maybe one out of 10 to 15 things will work. And that's if you're lucky. Right? If you're someone who gets disappointed quickly, maybe this isn't what you want to do. But if you realize that when that one thing works, it's better than anything you can imagine. That first time that I changed the function of an enzyme, it happened at about two o'clock in the morning and I was the only one in the lab and I saw the data. And I can still remember looking around for someone to share it with. And I, I couldn't find it, but I was ecstatic. I was, I couldn't go to sleep that night. It was such an invigorating, exhilarating experience. Nothing has ever compared to it. And you get that occasionally. And that paper you just talked about, that was another example. When we first saw that eat me signal show up on that cancer cell and we could kill that cancer cell with a new target. That's a feeling that is indescribable. And that's what keeps you going. Now, do you want to do that or not? Are you willing to take all those <laughs> complete failures and rejections and people saying, oh, that's not going to work? Does that motivate you or not? And if you, if it does, this is the way to go. Now, I wouldn't say that's advice. It's like, do you like that or not? And find things like that in life that excite you, that, that resonate with you, that will get you up on a Saturday morning instead of staying in bed and come in and do something. So, and look at you, you're talking to me when other people were probably out having happy hours. So it's a Friday, half a Friday evening. So find the thing that you love doing. All right, everyone, this is Dr. Charles Craig. Thank you so much.